That's it. That was the funny part of tonight. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says, I'm hoping, <laughs> then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but after he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he really find faith on earth? There's three different things that I find weird about this passage of Scripture. Because the passage of Scripture has always been used to exhort believers to keep praying for whatever it is they need God to do. And it says... If you're like the woman who bugged the judge and he got so tired of it, he said, fine, 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 fine. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. How much more will your Father in heaven give you what you request? Well, I'm a little confused because first it says, Jesus told this parable so men would pray without losing heart. Okay, then he tells the story of, a, an, of an annoying woman and an unjust judge. And the, the, the picture we get in our mind is that he, she's like bothering him at, late at night, knocking on his doors, and he wants to get some sleep, so he finally just gives in. And she says, you know, avenge my adversaries. Now, see, that's interesting to me. See, I didn't know judges avenged Adversaries. I've never heard this before. If, if you think about our court system, which is built on the Judeo-Christian ethic, judges hear cases, and they hear both sides of cases, but judges don't avenge. In fact, if judges avenge, that's considered a form of malpractice, because the purpose of the judge is to uphold the law without bias. So in fact, the judge, the judge in our court system is the opposite of the judge of this parable. And then Jesus says, well, him being unjust, him being not, him not having any concern of God or man, he agreed to avenge her adversary. How much more will your God in heaven avenge your adversary even though he suffers along with you? Bears along with you. Which is saying, even though you get on his nerves in your own mind, of course. He's saying, even if you pray a lot, how much more will God come through than someone like this guy? So, the way the scripture is applied in Christianity is appropriate. Pray a lot for the thing you want. You won't get on God's nerves. And if you do, maybe he'll move faster. <laughs> that works for me. I've always, I've always felt really good about it. I go, let's bug God about this some more. For instance, my youngest daughter, I'm convinced anything I have her pray for, God will do. So I'll say, hey, come over here. She goes, what do you want me to get him to do now? <laughs> I said, this is, will you please pray for this? Because I, I just think God has favorites. I don't know. I, I, since I'm not one of them, I can say that. But seriously, get a little kid to pray for something, and pretty much God will do anything, you know. So tell God to give Daddy a pony. So 
Um, but then he says, and Jesus says, but in all this, even though I tell you to pray a lot, and even though you learn that God's going to move on your behalf, I wonder when I come back if I'm actually going to see any faith on the earth. And that would imply, that would imply that he's saying, yeah, you can pray all you want about that one thing. Or you could have faith about that one thing. That God will do what God sees as best. Which undermines the whole concept of bugging God. Bugging God. And a really good sermon is sitting there when you say the term bugging God. Because I like to get those cool little catchphrases so that when I post the videos on the internet, people go, what do you mean bugging God? Let's check out what that is, you know. But the problem is, while I don't, I don't want to say that the scripture is inappropriately applied, you know, for centuries before I figured it out for the church at large, but what I want to say is the scripture has been inappropriately applied for centuries, but I figured out, and I'm going to give my gift to the church at large, and that is that this scripture may be a parable that includes elements of praying without ceasing and you have not because you ask not this scripture is about faith it's actually about faith a really good example of this would be um any of us who have kids, or anybody, anybody who knows anyone that has kids, will see in practice the behavior of they only come to you when they want something. Then the rest of the time you're invisible to them, and then the minute they want something, suddenly they're pouring on the sauce. Okay? So they are the widow bothering the judge at that point. And we as parents will say, whatever, I'll give you 20 bucks to go to the movies or whatever, because that's faster than saying, you know, the only time you ever talk to me is when you want money. Which doesn't serve any purpose, because you never win that argument. Because the answer back is, duh, I'm a kid. I'm supposed to be like that. So you lose the argument. But you know if your kid was a contributing member of the household, a contributing member of society, you would shower them naturally with gifts from your abundance. That they may never even have to come to you and ask you for moving money. They might, oh my gosh, get an allowance for doing chores. So Jesus is actually separating, saying, yeah, if you want to do entry-level Christianity here, yeah, pray about it, pray about it, pray about it, bug God, you know, wake him up in the middle of the night, bug the judge to fight your adversary for you. Go ahead. He's going to do it because the unjust are going to do it. He's going to do it more. But I'm curious, when I come back, am I going to see any faith here? Hmm. What's he talking about? Hmm. What's he talking about? We'd still rather our kids come to us for money than, like, steal it. Remember that. So it's still part of life that they come to us for money. So Jesus is saying, I would still rather you go to God in prayer for that problem that you're having than do nothing. But when I come back, am I going to see any faith here? And the faith that he's talking about reminds me of when he sent out the apostles that they had problems casting out a demon. And when Jesus showed her, he goes, my gosh, have ye no faith? And he cast out the demon. And they're like, well, what did we do wrong? And Jesus said, this is the kind that only comes 
from prayer and fasting. And so many people interpreted that scripture, interpret that scripture to mean, had you had the demoniac pray and fast for a while, the barnacle would have come loose easier. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, had you prayed and fasted more, you would have known how to handle this situation. But you're still very carnal. You're not ready to cast out demons just yet. And I think that's the exact same kind of faith that Jesus is talking about in the scripture, that the key word is adversary. I have never in my life heard this passage of scripture preached and someone said, back in those days, the court system worked like this and it would be normal for her to have an adversary and the adversary would be doing this. I've, try, I've been try, I'm racking my brains all day to think of something that the adversary might be doing. And then I realize you can come up with things like, well, they're, they're taking away her property unfairly. That's the only thing I can think about. Think of some action that's happening right now that she would be bothering the judge all night long or something. But none of that is specified in the scripture. And what I find interesting is that it's not specified in the scripture, which means what is the point of the parable is the point praying a lot about one thing, which Jesus derides several times in his ministry, or is it about the adversary and the problem of having an adversary? And is it about what's the solution? to that problem with the adversary. And if I can keep saying adversary enough, you'll know that the key word here is adversary. The, the key problem of the parable is the adversary. I come from a, a theater background, and, and the key to understanding a script is to find the point of it, to find where the accent lies. So you will look at a concept, and I exaggerate, and you will look at a concept, or you will look at a concept, or you will look at a concept. You will look at a concept, and you're figuring out where does that accent go to make the most sense of what each passage in a script is saying. Well, it's the same thing here is where's the emphasis that Jesus placed? Did Jesus place the emphasis on bugging the judge? Did Jesus place the emphasis on praying a lot about one thing? And I would hate to train up a generation of people to not pray a lot about one thing. I would hate, you know, I would hate to be this, I would hate this, this sermon to be the one that goes into the time capsule that represents my ministry because that's not true. I don't think Jesus is saying don't pray incessantly about one thing. Sometimes that's all you can do is pray incessantly about something. If, you're, if your baby's in the hospital, I, I mean, what else are you going to do? No, that's not the time to run around and play faith games. You know, I'm going to have faith to show God that I have faith. Nah, you pray. But he said, when I come back, though, when you've had time to stew, in future generations are here, what kind of people am I going to find? Am I going to find the whiners, the complainers, the gossipers, the back backbiters? Am I going to find, you know, kindergarten Christians, you know, that only know one way of getting God's attention, and that's by being a bit of a nuisance? Or am I going to find people that have, have taught faith to their children, to their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, what am I going to find? Well, the kind of faith he's talking about has nothing to do with what people think when they hear the word faith. Because we're so selfish, we think this passage of Scripture has to do with I need something, I want something, I got an owie. But it doesn't. It has to do with spiritual warfare. It has to do 
with having an adversary. It has to do with either turning to God and telling him, you know, I have a problem, I have a problem, fix it, I have a problem, fix it, the siege happening, I have a problem, fix it, I keep, you know, or having the faith to take the power and authority over said adversary. Jesus said, going to God over and over and over and over again about your adversary, he said, saying that word, how many times so far? We can have an adversary jar and I'd be rich. Oh yeah, I'd be the one putting the money in. How about if we do it where every time I say adversary, someone else puts money in the adversary jar, then I'd be rich. But he say, if that's all you're going to do, then that's the best you can do. That's better than nothing. That's better than having him rob, kill, destroy, you know, things like that. But even better, be a people of faith and train up a, pe a, a generation of people of faith who train up subsequent generations of faith. And the kind of faith he's talking about is the same kind of faith that he addressed the apostles with when he said, this kind comes with prayer and fasting. The kind of faith that comes from prayer and fasting that can, you, enables you to cast out demons. Because the adversary, drum roll please, the adversary in this parable is Satan, is the enemy of our soul. That's the adversary. Not just any adversary, it's the adversary. Because it goes back to Jesus' exhortation at the end of the parable is incongruent with the beginning of the parable and what we perceive the parable to be about. And again, it says Jesus gave this parable to encourage men to pray and not lose heart. But he gives an example of being persistent and annoying. Now, may I point out, when I'm stalking the judge, I may be being persistent, but I'm long since having lost heart. I'm desperate. And desperate and losing the heart See what I'm saying? It's not a show of how aggressive we can be with God and how persistent we can be with God. It's about how faithful we can walk in God recognizing His faithfulness towards us. The adversary. Satan, Lucifer, the dark one. I call him the little red guy. The angel gone bad. I want to tell a story, and I, I haven't figured out how I'm going to lay the groundwork for this story. It's very awkward how it came to be. So, how do I say this? I don't. I want to protect the the innocent in this story, but I want to tell the gravity of the story. Okay? You with me? So, I'm going to say this. I meet a lot of people in a lot of ways in regards to my ministry life, in regards to my art life, and in regards to my personal life. And Sometimes God uses these strange means to bring great people into my life, to bring great people into my ministry life, and to bring great people into my personal life, and to bring great people into his love, glory, deliverance, and salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. I recently had someone who did not know very much about me send me a provocative email. And they knew 
that I was some kind of a musician. And I think enough said. And I read the email and I found it to be rather provocative. Well, I get a lot of emails in this life, and, and sometimes, meaning all the times, I Google email addresses. I, I put email addresses through my social networks, because that's how you find people in social networks, is you punch in their email address, and that's the email address they use on MySpace or Facebook, and I highly recommend everybody do this. Sometimes you can find out who people are who are trying to talk to you. Oh, some, some gentleman who wrote me something incredibly provocative, I went online and I found them on a social network. And I found out they were engaged, and I found out, you know, the pretty, pretty lady that they were engaged to, and read about their lives and everything. This is getting good, huh? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> let's just say, let's just say his name was John and her name was Mary. <laughs> and I wrote back in response to this provocative email, how does Mary feel about it? And they wrote back, who is this? And they were terrified. And then, I felt the Holy Spirit just fall on my head. Just fall on my head. And as loud as a tornado, I heard, you only get one chance to save a soul. One chance. And I wrote back, I didn't mean to spook you. You don't know me. And I, I explained how I found out who they were and about their lives. And I said, you might want to think about what you're doing and how you're doing it and who it's affecting. This person wrote back and said, I'm so sorry. Thank you for... Um, Thank, thank you for the, the slap on the face. I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't be doing this. I never do this. I'm just so screwed up. Something's wrong with me. I don't know who I am. And my whole world is falling apart and I should be dead. And I wrote back, no, you shouldn't. You should step back and realize that while you're playing around on the internet, there's a God in heaven who's watching your every move. And out of how many billions of people you could have contacted, you got me. And I, I completely understand where you're at. I've been where, you've at, where you're at. I've done what you're doing. And I have found my identity, I found my life, I found my future, I found my hope, I found my love, because I found God. And my friend, tonight you did too. And he wrote back and said, I have given up on God because I pray and nothing happens. I've asked God to make sense of my life and no sense is made. I have begged God for a sign and there's never a sign. And I wrote back, can I call you? And I, 20 minutes went by. I figured it was all over and I had done it and I got the yes. And then 20 minutes went by again, and I got a phone number. And I called this young man, and I said, you said God never gives you the sign that you asked for. Have you ever heard the story about 
the woman trapped on a desert island and she prays for God to get her off the island and a boat comes and she says, oh no, 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 I, I'm waiting on God, <laughs> you know? And then uh, a submarine comes, no, no, no thanks, <laughs> I'm waiting on God. Oh, an airplane comes and I'm waiting on God and of course she, she dies on that island and then she faces God and, and, and she says, I, I don't get it, I prayed, I asked you to rescue me. How come you didn't? He goes, are you kidding? I sent you a boat, a submarine, and a plane. What do I have to do? Said Paisley. I said, dude, I'm your sign, brother. I'm your sign. I am saying to you, we are complete strangers, and you sent me an email that could have destroyed your entire life. And when I called you on it, your reaction was, I should die for this. And you are talking to someone who absolutely thinks you're normal and okay. You just need someone to talk to. And you need to know that God loves you just the way you are. You need counseling is what you need. And he goes, I need more than that. I mean, you know, you do need more than that. You need to get off your 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 pity horse and you need to get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because tonight is your night, brother. Tonight is your night. Now, because there's elements here that someone may hear and and not hear, I mean, but you know, I like I said, names have been changed, certain things have been changed to protect the innocent and so forth. But what I want to tell you is that this person said to me, I've prayed for God to help me when I have a problem and nothing happens. And I give him three tries and nothing happens and then I pray to Satan and something happens. He said, you know that every time I pray to Satan, I get an answer. I get assistance. And every time I pray to God, I don't get any assistance. I said, do you know how dumb you are? I said, do you know by the mere fact that you are convinced that Satan is a real entity, which he is, you've just proven God? See, it's so stupid. And his people are so stupid. Because if Satan is real, where did he come from? Who's his enemy? Jesus Christ. Not just God, but the specific God that gave us Jesus. And he goes, you know, you're right. I, go, I am right. I'm so right, rain isn't this right. I said, I am in the exact spot at the exact time to perform the exact ministry in your life. And there's nothing you can say contrary to that. You can hang up on me. You can never talk to me again. But you can never say that I prayed to God for a sign and I didn't get one. Because I'm a big ass sign. Now what are you going to do? It was amazing. It was amazing. And uh, I, I need to tell you, uh, <laughs> it was time to feed the dogs when it was over. <laughs> you know, it was, it was an all-nighter. And I prayed for him, and as I was praying for him, he described the demonic manifestation happening in his body and how cold he got, and that his skin was crawling, and he was shivering. And every time he tries to pray, how this happens. And he told me how many times he's seen a burnt baby on his bed threatening him if he ever prays to Jesus what will happen to him. He tells me one story after another of all these demonic manifestations happening in his life. And forgive me, everybody knows I like scary stuff, but I like fake scary stuff, not real scary stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I like a good horror movie, but this was pretty scary stuff. And, and I've heard this stuff my whole Christian walk. I've seen this stuff my whole Christian walk. And, you know, I remember getting off the phone with him going, now, let's see, are we going to sleep with the lights on or off tonight? And I went, I'm not that guy. 